Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It is now Saturday, July 20th, 2024, and it is 4 a.m. in Palestine. Thank you for joining our 24 Hours for Palestine. And this session, A Moon Will Rise from Darkness, Poetry for Palestine. Um, my name is Andrea Asaf, and um, I am zooming in right now from the San Francisco Bay Area, which is the unceded lands of the Bay Miwok and Ramatayush Ohlone people. And um, if you have been uh, live streaming, watching the live stream for a while with us, um, if you get an error message uh, on your live stream feed, please know that you can just refresh it and the page will come back. So thank you to everyone who's joining us from all over the world. Um, this is an incredible session, an incredible gathering of poets that we have today. Um, our session, A Moon Will Rise from Darkness, is inspired by the legendary poet Mahmoud Darwish, and it is a gathering of internationally acclaimed poets from Palestine, Lebanon, and the diaspora here in the U.S. coming together for this special reading of poetry and their poetry, which has for decades uplifted the stories, voices, resilience, beauty, and resistance of the Palestinian people. This session illuminates the soul of a people and tells the truths of lived experience and celebrates the rising global movement toward liberation, even in our darkest hours. Um, I am thrilled and honored to be joined by Naomi Shihabnai, Suher Hamad, Dima Shehabi, Zena Hashimbek, and Mosab Abu Toa. Um, we will be, uh, each poet will be reading for you today. Um, I'll briefly introduce each one and, um, and then at the end we'll have a conversation in this 90 minute session. Um, and we're so, so thrilled uh, that all of you are with us. I'm gonna invite Naomi uh, to come on camera. She will be our first reader and I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about Naomi Shihadna if you don't already know, which I can't imagine that you don't. Naomi is a poet, songwriter, novelist. She has published or contributed to over 30 volumes. Um, she has won, won many, many awards and recognitions, including in 2019, the Poetry Foundation designated her the Young People's Poet Laureate for the 2019-21 term, and her honors include awards from the International Poetry Forum, Texas Institute of Letters, National Book Critics Circle Lifetime Achievement Award, and four Pushcart Prizes. Um, she is a Guggenheim Fellow and uh, has many other fellowships and much, much more. And it is such an honor and joy, Naomi, to have you with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Andrea. And thanks for all the work you do with Art to Action. Also, thanks to Golden Thread and to my friends gathered here. Uh, it is such an honor to appear with you, dear poets. And also uh, sending out a lot of love to everyone who's taking the time to listen. We appreciate uh, your care and your concern. Uh, I wanted to start by reading a quote from a correspondent of mine, an Arab-Australian poet named Omar Sacker. Uh, he is the author of Non-Essential Work. And only today he wrote this message. Every day is difficult. Every day is a nightmare witnessed and a joy to live with love. And there is no reconciling the two. How can we continue like this is a question people hurl despairingly. And most days, I am one of them. Uh, as we witness the news and... Uh, have the deepest dream of things becoming better for our Palestinian people, for all people. Uh, we feel this frustration that we're not able to do more all the time. So uh, I wanted to read a poem for Mahmoud Darwish since the title comes uh, from his poem. This is called Endure. Mahmoud, so spare inside his elegant suit stepped across stony fields, bent to brush the petal of a flower, didn't pick it, closed his eyes, holding one hand with the other, carrying the presence of blossom back to the page. 
for those who would never walk a field, never bend down. He found a way to carry the cry of a lost goat and the cry of a people without stumbling. Don't forget the streaks of tears mapping his soft cheeks, his large somber glasses, the edgy poke of his thin shoulders, how he stood a bit to the side, hand over heart, his delicate hand on the stem of a glass, toasting the roads, the wandering winds. Mothers and fathers enduring without justice felt his dapper presence sustaining them, though they might have found it hard to name. The unchosen beauty of struggle and love mixing in a fresh tonic any might drink. His brilliance spilled in every language, though Arabic owned him. He became a perfect country moving through the world wherever he was. And he, its ruler, its teacher and prophet, he, its infinite dusty workers pausing with shovels to stare beyond the ruin they could see to what they will always believe in. In memory of Mahmoud Darwish, who died in 2008 um, in my state here of Texas, where I'm speaking from. This is a poem called Hours, uh, dedicated to President Joe Biden. I pledge allegiance to the beautiful boy running down the road with a white flag and a backpack, but he can't hear me. We love the dusty girl twirling in a green skirt, arms raised, maybe saying, don't shoot, I am a dancer. She can't hear us either. And the thousands of little dead ones who float weeping around us in our sleep hear no echo of care from you, from you, Joe, from me. We're just bereaved parents out here wandering in our own grief. Think how special it is to have a child who knows and trusts you. Those who felt like ours, who went away too soon. Don't you feel them in the eyes of every worried child? How could you not? How could you appease a vengeful army before the eyes of children like ours? Beautiful Gaza. The people who live there, Musab, this is for you. The people who live there made it feel like home. They planted strawberries, weeded fields, carried little backpacks to school. You like to go places? So did they, but they couldn't go far. They could go to the next town or camp if they were lucky. Sometimes they blew up balloons or cooked outside on open fires like a party. There are many kinds of lucky. I saw a video, beautiful Gaza, my home, narrated by a young girl. I think TV stations might play that video every day now. They owe this to 40,000 people. Once in days that felt more free, we traveled from the Egyptian border up through Gaza on a public bus. We had passports, we could go places. The bus rattled mightily. You lay in the far back seat with malaria, sweat pooling on your forehead, a bandana tied around your nose and mouth. This was before everyone had masks. Women and men who didn't even know you stooped to offer water, wipe your brow. This is what I remember of Gaza. Beautiful fields. The people wiped your brow. Uh, Before I was a husband, I was a boy, and my homework was missing. Paper with numbers on it, stacked 
and lined. I was looking for my piece of paper, proud of this plus that, then multiplied, not remembering if I had left it on the table after showing to my uncle or the shelf after combing my hair. But it was still somewhere, and I was going to find it and turn it in, make my teacher happy, make her say my name to the whole class. Before everything got subtracted in a minute, even my uncle, even my teacher, even the best math student and his baby sister who couldn't talk yet. And now I would do anything for a problem I could solve. Moon over Gaza. This is the moon speaking. This poem recently became a short video. Um, I am lonely for my friends. They liked me, trusted my coming. I think they looked up at me more than other people do. I, who have been staring down so long, see no reason for the sorrows humans make. I dislike the scuffle of bombs blasting very much. It blocks my view. A landscape of grieving feels different afterwards, different sheen from a simple desert, rubble of walls, silent children who once said my name like a prayer. Sometimes I am bigger than a golden plate, a giant coin and everyone gasps. Maybe it is wrong that I am so calm. No explosions. To enjoy fireworks, you would have to have lived a different kind of life. And uh, for all the people who maintain joy in the most impossible, difficult circumstances, and for all the people um, we love and care about, whom we're close to or whom we've never met, I'll read this one. It has a quote from my city, my grandmother who lived in, in the West Bank, and uh, she said this when she was 103 years old. She lived to be 106. She said, I always wait for the morning, but don't know why the morning never comes. And this was recently in uh, the beautiful uh, literary magazine from the Friends School in Ramallah, uh, which I, I attended one semester and my brother attended longer. Tatriz is the name of their literary magazine this year, and they just brought it out this year. My Palestinian grandma, who prayed five times a day, even her devotion couldn't bring the morning bigger than sunshine. Was she waiting for roads to open, blockades to disappear, flurries of almond blossoms showering upon the road? Turn left to Ramallah, then south to Jerusalem. Tear gas was not her language. When gassed in her own room by soldiers in uniform, she said to me in Arabic, never mind, they're lost. She wanted to find her old house still murmuring her name in its wrought iron handrail broad stairs shining, the rooms she never wanted to leave, still gleaming in the light. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi, for that beautiful reading. And your work is always such an inspiration. Um, an extraordinary storyteller you are through the most beautiful words and images. Thank you so much for being here and sharing with us. 
And it is, um, I have to say, it, it's such an honor for me to be with all of you. This is a room full of like heroes of poetry, truly. You all are, and um, and certainly my heroes. Um, and next, I have the tremendous pleasure of welcoming Suher Hamad, whose publications include Palis Born Palestinian, Born Black, Drops of This Story, First Writing Since, um, she has won many awards and recognitions, of course, the Peabody Award uh, winning she, and is most well known really as the voice of a generation, the voice of the hip hop generation for Palestine in the United States um, and is well known for uh, the Peabody Award winning uh, HBO show Russell Simmons Presents Steph Poetry and also the Tony Award winning Russell Simmons Presents Steph Poetry Jam on Broadway. And other books include Zatar Diva, Breaking Poems, so many. She's the recipient of the Audre Lorde uh, Writing Award and a 2009 American Book Award and many things. Um, and an incredible inspiration. It's incredible joy and honor to have you with us, Suhair. Welcome. Habibti, thank you for having me. You can hear me fine. We've seen enough Palestinians in grief, right? We've seen enough Palestinian faces now. Did, did you see what they did to our faces? It's wild because I'm looking at you, but all these people are looking at me. But I'm only, I can only see you. I love that. I'm honored to be here. I have a lot to say, but instead I'm going to read. I want to read Jabalia from the Rafah's Gaza Suite. I think of all the faces that we'll never see and all of the faces that have been mutilated. I think of monstrosity and nightmare and echo. The echo. So I want to read from the Gaza Suite, Habibti, Habayad. And then I'm going to read from the Gaza Suite is on this device, which a lot of our peers in Palestine be using stuff like this. And everything, the hundreds of pieces I've offered from my heart since October 7th and from before have been, this is the new version of what I was working on. When I think of the journalists and the poets, and how they have documented their lives and the lives of the people around them. I don't think people think of the devices that they're on and that how they are the actual energy and the technology. A woman wears a bell, carries a light, calls, searches through madness. Abdad Yassin calls for rafah for bread, orange peel under nails, blue glass under feet, gathers children in Zaytun, Sitting with dead mothers, she unearths tunnels and buries sons onto trauma. A score and a day rings a bell. She is dizzy more than yesterday, less than tomorrow. A zigzag back, Dwayme back, humming Suba back, Shatila back, Ramle back, Janine back, Il Khalil back. Il puts all of it, all of it underground in ancestral chests. She rings a bell, promising something she can't see. Faith is that. Faith is this all over the land, under the belly of wind. But Nilhawa, she perfumed the love of a burning sea, concentrating refugee camp, crescent targeted red, a girl's charred cold face, dog eaten body, angels rounded into lockdown, shelled injured shock, weapons for advancing armies, clearing forests, sprayed into a city, Osage tree, human skin contact explosion. These are our children. She chimes through Nablus back, Yafa back, back shot under spotlight, phosphorus murdered, libel public relations, public, my relation. A bell fired in Jericho rings through blasted windows. A woman carries bones in bags under eyes, disbelieving, becoming numb, dumbed by numbers front and back. Gaza onto Gaza for Gaza. I'm sorry, Gaza. I'm sorry. She sings for the whole powerless world. Her notes pitch perfect. The bell, a death toll. 
I read this in Palestine. I read this in Palestine in front of the Sulta, in front of the authority. Imagine how they treated me. And why are we here all these years later? And anyone who survived that. So I'm just going to read from this right here. Um, oh, you can't see it. But basically, I just take my notes. I think it's interesting. First of all, this is really actually hard to breathe in. So imagine our representatives and all of the Shabab and the young men and women. Imagine that in Gaza, you still haven't seen a woman take off her hijab. Have you? No. We st they haven't cl smelled anything clean. So I'm actually thankful for this. And I'm thankful for you. I'm just going to read from these notes and then stop a few, a few minutes. Um... This nausea won't subside. When to look away, dizzying. What to look at, instead, the dead. What it cries, this water, my family. The salt, my earth. Seizures, unending sounds collide within heads. Fires burn hearts out. Chests all together scorched earth. Shook, the survivor shaking the witness. Stunned, and still to bury the buried. And ahead, winter wars, no promise of spring. Kids' angles, kids' necks at impossible angles, a land of angels, bombs blast some apart, leave others whole, empty, there was always blood, sea of it, their spring bodies in October clothes, on tiles check for pulse, parents pace the loss, immense, an ocean of kites. For our beloved poet, they'd seen her at the hospital asking for help. He gasps from all the bodies. I saw her before I recognized her. I saw her before I recognized her. Asleep, like at home. Asleep, asleep a piece. He sighs, yalla mama, yalla, wake up. A sister trails behind a wife, repeating, I smell him. I dressed him myself on Friday. Searches bodies that are scraps. Finds only his clothes. What? She found only his clothes over the drones. Azagruta escapes a mother's chest. Her son found by his jacket. She is grateful. She is sure. For our batal. Our people have lost so many people and they have not had a day off. Wa'el and Hamza. Entire families, Wa'il kisses beloved heads, palms, hearts for proof. The men rock his shoulders, utter life into Wa'il, who streams live, willing and able, returns his family to the source, to the mercy, tells us these tears are not proof of our defeat. They are proof oof, of our humanity. Thank you, Suhair. Uh, those of you who can't see all of us, were, uh, there was like applause and heartbreak and love streaming out in this uh, backstage here uh, on the live stream. Suhair, the way your truth telling tears my heart all the time, every time, I am grateful for you. I am grateful for you, Habiti, always. Um, I'm going to take a moment as moderator to share a poem um, and then uh, go on with our, our guests. Um, and I'm taking this moment because Suhair has been such an influence on my own work as a writer and theater artist for forever. Um, and this is a short piece called uh, Quadroon about being Arab American in times of war and genocide. Every fourth drop is from there, if blood can be calibrated. 
Every fourth drop carries the desert, drips from the cedar, stains a small rock on the shore. Every fourth drop knows the intimacy of sirens, the smoky trail of hookah and wrinkled hands hard as olives, freshly picked. If blood indeed can carry such things, and they say it can, those same who lift our arms and pass radar through our bodies at the gate, those same who swear they will never forget, but daily do, those same who point flags like our thick fingers, gnarled and tight, they search my face for it. They count every fourth drop, they believe in this calibration, the unum one fourth from there, wherever there is this year and every fourth drop boils this time of year leaping in alarm and rage screaming past the sinews to insist on mingling with the other three to insist in a cellular universe that there is no detectable difference i cannot be separated each says i am of you i refuse this calibration i run through you as you do me but you waste my blood as yours as if i were yours to waste i am dripping from the cedar tree dripping from the cloudless sky staining this rocks these rocks this shore and spilling you all over me as if you were mine to spill i am boiling against your cold i am cutting the sky with my scream i carry the sound of the air raid through veins embedded with shrapnel I am the fourth drop, every fourth drop, ringing through the desert, not knowing how anyone will ever hear. So I count each drop of blood that falls. And I ask if every fourth drop ran together and infused the other three until all were four and one were one, would I be a different person? In a different world? Would it have been a different day? Or could I be? October. Our next amazing poet uh, Dima Shihabi is Palestinian, the author of 13 Departures for the Moon, co-editor of Al Mutanabi Street Starts Here, and co-author with Marilyn Hacker of uh, Diaspo Rengo, which Dima, I got to see you read at Rawi uh, a long time ago at the Radius of Arab American Writers. And I'm so glad you're with us today. Thank you, Dima, for joining us. Thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you so much to Golden Thread Productions, to Art to Action for putting this amazing event together. I'm so proud to be here with you all. I just want to start out by saying that I stand unequivocally with the people of Gaza and the rest of Palestine, who are not only fighting on the ground to survive, but also upholding dignity, resistance, and maintaining a rightful place on this land. Um, I'd like to begin with a poem called Variations on Love in a Time of Genocide, which is a series of tanka, which takes um, vignettes from different people experiencing different things in Gaza. Um, and specifically, I overheard a journalist whose name is Mahmoud Al Amoudi, who recounted the story of two elderly women in this amazing exchange of consolation. They were elderly, they were beautiful, and yet the entire spirit of resistance and Samud existed in them. So this is dedicated to them. Variations on love in a time of genocide. Those little mothers half lay the night in daisy dresses. Their daughters sway with them, hoping to God the dawn won't arrive. Those broken pelvis girls with their bellies on swings strung between two skies. A homeland falls off their chest like a precipice. Those Aleppo pines lush the forest floor, small shoots prick through the asphalt. How many flechettes tear down ligaments, break skin? 
those cats sow saplings and lizards' mouths and float flit past riverbeds, past limbs for amputation. Ask, what is home? A grave? Those tattooed women from Khan Yunus say, our clothes reek of cactus sweat, so the great solace is near. Looking up, the moon wanes. Those displaced faces slanting the wire, screaming, the starling seeks death, but we mustn't let it go. One saved bird is God. That tall prisoner, as illumined as water, his hand squeezed behind the chair says, I belong here. Soldier's eyes like teeth. Those wet star showers, ripe and white phosphorus burn. Oh love, how to get a bit lost, create footnotes for this blood red night. This uh, next poem is uh, Gaza Ghazal. And um, I, I was just remembering uh, the broken poets in Islamic history, Al Khansa. And this sort of evokes her memory. Raza Raza. On his unearthed chest, she lays three time brazed ghazals. History on repeat, she mourns like Al Khansa, broken and splayed by ghazals. Brown-eyed camera, wounded child with no surviving family, shakes on camera, silencing my domestic rhythms and overplayed ghazals. There's no room on the train for dark-skinned refugees. Pundits sing for a white Europe free of humane ghazals. On the phone, Shavab says, I believe. Beneath the rubble, a child sees an angel's oiled light opening a gateway for ghazals. She retaliates for her neighbor's insult. Rudeness can only be handled one way by practitioners of immigre ghazals. It's now or never, he sings as the bombs fall on Gaza. From a sunlit room, his deep cigarette voice beats all plaintive. Ghazals. Like this far mosque, you're always there for me. What name do we give it? This rain light we bend for weighted ghazals. November, Indian summer warmth lulls the poet to sleep, but she wakes to a war wind stir, parched leaves, crimson paper ghazals. Um, this next poem is a series of sonnets uh, which explores the relationship between um, mothers and daughters and how daughters are often placeholders for their mother for their mothers. Um, it's a sonnet sonnet sequence which um, also takes place in Gaza as my mother hails from Gaza. It's called Sun Theater Sonnets. It starts with an epitaph by Agha Shahid Ali who says, "For whose world is not in ruins? Whose?" You wrote me from a bed where you'd see the mountain's alders corral the sky. Who'll empty my last pocket when I'm gone? Once sitting with you on a fountain's edge, I unpinned the debris in my pocket into the basin where you had unfingered rose petals, their outline fading into our bleating desires, the still. When you passed, they transferred a ring from your small hand to mine, and I rested my lips in your mouth's smallest pocket. Oh, mother, I tore your letter and hurled my body to the sun-long corridor. Your skin was desolation. Come, hovering angel. Come, hovering angel. Desolation leaves me gray, chain-smoking by a quaking aspen tree, who moans a throaty sea song when the wind bristles through its taut ribcage. I'm your daughter, holding a place, panting on a roadway where you leave me no sun to pass through. In a morning dream, I dwarf you, removing a seashore from your face. 
Then your lips move and you wave your hand. God Almighty, you say, your eyes sewn tightly, though you drag your thick desert voice over zoysia grass, exhuming miniature yellow butterflies and displacing them to a thicket of dusk after the wet. To a thicket of dusk after the wet, you pray, don't let me leave this earth broken-willed, O coiler of sorrows, O lost root. Eyes like forest trees, you breathe it in whole while the mountain pelts you with clouds, semen-scented chestnut trees, Edelweiss. Thirty years before, you trailed a messy sun to your father's small tomb in Gaza, salt in your nostrils as the lemon light bound your eyes to the orchard's gray marrow. Decades later, your daughter averts her gaze from the limb mine soil while her lover says, breathe. The soil coos and rallies her waters. For whose unlucky dead are at peace? Whose? For whose unlucky dead are at peace? Whose? Quarantina, every seaside city juts a neighborhood where it's illegal sell jujube in the streets. Love disguises itself to feed you apricots, mangoes. Afternoons, pigeon thicketed the sun while we ambled underneath rusty green shutters. Do you remember how easily we held hands? How the sky was full of twigs when our skin touched? To open this hour is all, you'd say. At the corner, we hemmed our skirts, donning heels for long embroidered dresses. The seamstress swears she saw you as you were, a field misting the pond, a bent country. Thank you. Thank you. So beautiful, Dima, your imagery and the way you describe and help us paint the picture, paint the picture, the image for us is so beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, our next reader, uh, very honored to introduce is uh, Zena Hashembek, is a Lebanese poet, and her third full length poetry collection, O, uh, was um, published in 22 by Penguin Books and won the 2023 Arab American Book Award for Poetry. Um, other collections, Louder Than Hearts, and um, There Was and How Much there was uh, was a 2016 laureate's choice um, to live in autumn winner of the 2013 backwaters prize um, so much more her work has appeared in the atlantic the nation the new york times poetry plowshare shares world literature today the academy of american poets um, zena also created the duet as a uh, bilingual poetic form in which English and Arabic exist separately, but in relationship with each other. And her poem, Makam, won Poetry Magazine's 2017 Frederick Bach Prize. Um, every single writer here has much longer bios than this, but by way of brief introduction, welcome, Zena. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, it's, um, it's very, uh, it's an honor and it's, very moving for me to be with you in this virtual space and Dima is with me in this actual space for which I am grateful. Um, I am grateful for friendships in, in this, in this time. I think without our friends, I mean, I, I think we have lost our minds, but without our friends, it would be even worse. So I'm thankful for the love of our friends uh, and I'm thankful for the poets. And of course, uh, I am forever grateful for Palestinians who are daily in Palestine, who are paying the price daily so that we might all one day be free. None of us are free until Palestine is free. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to read four sonnets. I've been working. Uh, I immigrated to America about two and a half years ago, and I started writing in sonnets. Um, but also the sonnets are palindromes, which means I, I read it from top to bottom, and then I flip it and read it from bottom to top. And I think it's a way for me to resist singular meaning or a singular reality. And I think there is no greater dissonance now than 
the dissonance we are living in to be here among like I'm in California I look out my window and I see oaks but I also see carnage in the oaks so it's you're always seeing at least two different realities and so I think these sonnets kind of speak to that as well to this um reality to, to all the realities we we live simultaneously this one begins with a with a phrase that I actually said to Dima, uh, who just read on the phone. It's called Spring Sonnet. Our dead are more alive than they're living. Our dead are more alive than they're living, I said to my friend and might have meant it. Meanwhile, the maple blooms and the marriage withers goes quiet. I stare at the news of the dead, of the blood and the flower. I say lost love, but I mean history. I don't know what I mean by more alive. I weep in the car, the bathroom, the bed. I'm thinking of the violence of language. Settle. Lovers use words to escape fear, to stay. Oppressors use words to possess. I think I'm trying to understand life. No, I'm trying to understand endings. It's almost April again. What's almost? It's almost April again. What's almost no? I'm trying to understand endings, I think. I'm trying to understand life. To stay. Oppressors use words to possess. Settle. Lovers use words to escape fear. I'm thinking of the violence of language. I weep in the car, the bathroom, the bed. I don't know what I mean by more. Alive, I say. Lost. Love. But I mean history of the dead of the blood. And the flower withers. Goes quiet. I stare at the news. Meanwhile, the maple blooms. And the marriage I said to my friend and might have meant it, our dead are more alive than they're living. This is uh, titled Southern Sonnet. And I was thinking about the journalists killed in South Lebanon and, of course, the journalists killed in Gaza uh, as I wrote this. I also wrote this around Thanksgiving where everyone here was being grateful and eating large turkeys. Southern Sonnet. I'm trying to write you a love song, but the news overspills as I boil coffee. Suppose no ruins open a poem. Remember the hidden cyclamens, the mountains. I ask and fear my answers. If I sharpen my rage, will it cut through public grief? We feed on names and nightmares. We repeat when our children's children are born, may your days be much more beautiful. In the South, Journalists are murdered and forbidden rain falls mournful like poets. On this northern continent, strangers sell smiles with large turkeys and murderous things. Here, we lose language and praise barren peace. Here, we lose language and praise. Barren, peace smiles with large turkeys and murderous things. 
On this northern continent, strangers sell forbidden rainfalls. Mournful like poets in the south, journalists are murdered and born. May your days be much more beautiful, we repeat. When our children's children are public grief, we feed on names and nightmares. If I sharpen my rage, will it cut through the mountains? I ask and fear. My answers? Remember the hidden cyclamens. Suppose no ruins. Open the poem. The news overspills. As I boil coffee, I am trying to write you a love song, but this one I wrote as I was thinking about the 1982 siege of Beirut, which if you watch uh, films about is eerily resembles what's happening in Gaza now. Um, the starvation, the, the 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 violence of the violence and the weakness of the Israeli war machine. They must be so weak in order to be scared of us like this. Um, so I was thinking of Beirut 1982. Uh, I was also thinking of the summer of 2006. I was in Lebanon back then, and of course, uh, Israel started bombing. I was thinking about Gaza now and Gaza in 2014 and Gaza in so many other years. So this is survival sonnet. Gone, the rest of us. We plow memory, survival, bleeding gums. The dead aren't departing by sea. There are decades of song. Where were you in 2006? In 2014? I heard Gaza still on the balcony beckoning Beirut since 1982. Hello, are you listening? I haven't been courageous. The airports bombed and the bridges. No one's allowing us anger or visas. Though poetry pretends to complicate things, the story's simple. The land remains ours. Forget the dumb doves. As for trusted news, the grandmothers, they say the pots were hot. The grandmothers, they say the pots were hot. Forget the dumb doves. As for trusted news, the story's simple. The land remains. Ars poetica pretends to complicate things, allowing us anger or visas, though the airports bombed and the bridges. No one's listening. I haven't been courageous since 1982. Hello, are you on the balcony beckoning Beirut? In 2014, I heard Gaza's still song. Where were you in 2006? Departing by sea? There are decades of survival, bleeding gums. The dead aren't gone. The rest of us, we plow memory and this last one i wrote after kairoki's song tilka qadia uh, they start by singing yunqiz fi salahif bahriya wa yaqtul hayawanat bashariya fa tilka qadia wa tilka qadia he saves sea turtles and kills human animals so i was thinking about these uh, highly satirical lyrics from Kairoki. I was also, I mentioned Ziad here in reference to Ziad Rahbani, who is a Lebanese playwright and singer. This is Sea Turtle Sonnet. Our parents stayed during the civil war. Don't say we escaped, just that we too failed. We left Beirut on the verge of collapse and revolution. That clearing of hope, where would we be without it? Ask Ziad, who put the city on a stage and laughed at its slow ways of killing us with pills or memory. 
so many of us scream in concerts and sleep. When in doubt, try kuhl. The artist with Cairo in his name sings, that's a cause, my friend, and that's another. Save sea turtles and ignore oppression, poppies. When the dark times come, try yoga. Don't say we were betrayed, just that we too feared. Don't say we betrayed, just that we too feared, poppies. When the dark times come, try yoga, save sea turtles and ignore oppression. That's a cause, my friend, and that's another. The artist with Cairo in his name sings in concerts and sleep. When in doubt, try kuhl or memory. So many of us, so many of us scream at its slow ways of killing us with pills. Who put the city on a stage and laughed? Where would we be without it? Ask Ziyad and revolution, that clearing of hope. We left Beirut on the verge of collapse. Don't say we escaped. Just that we too failed our parents, stayed during the civil war. Thank you. Zaina, thank you so much. I am um, so moved by your capacity to say so much in sonnets, which is perhaps one of the hardest forms, I think. Uh, that was extraordinary. Thank you. Um, and now it is my great honor to introduce Mossab Abu Toa, who is a Palestinian poet, a short story writer, and an essayist from Gaza. Um, perhaps many of you who are watching now have been following Mossab um, these months on social media. His first collection of poetry, Things You May Find Hidden in My Ear, was a finalist for the National Book Critics, Critics Circle Award for Poetry and won the Palestine Book Award, the American Book Award, and the Walcott Poetry Prize. He is also the founder of the Edward Said uh, Library in Gaza, which he hopes to rebuild, and recently won an Overseas Press Club Award for his Letter from Gaza columns for The New Yorker, and it is such an honor to have you here with us, Mossab. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, uh, Andrea. Um, just before I forgot, uh, when you said uh, I'm a founder of the Edward Said Library, I remember that uh, I first uh, heard, or I think I don't know if I heard from Naomi or I sent her an email, her an email and she said that uh, Dr. Edward Said would be very proud of you for uh, creating this library. So that was one of the, uh, uh, the first uh, uh, communication between me and her. And I'm really thankful for her friendship and the friendship of so many other people <clears throat> who unfortunately I haven't met in person. I hope one day we will uh, meet each other and read uh, together, inshallah, in Gaza. Um, thank you again, Andrea, and thank big thanks to uh, 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 Art to Action. Uh, I'm going to read um, the first one that I want to, to start uh, reading is by Rifat al uh, who was murdered by the Israeli army, along with his uh, sister and her children, and another sibling, another brother, and his children. The, the famous poem is called, If I Must Die. And I remember myself writing a poem uh, just a month before uh, Rifat was killed. I was still in Gaza. Um, so his poem is, If I Must Die. If I must die, you must live to tell my story, to sell my things, to buy a piece of cloth and some strings, make it white with a long tail, so that a child somewhere in Gaza, while looking heaven in the eye, awaiting his dad who lived in a blaze and bid no farewell, not, not even to his flesh, not even to himself, sees the kite. My kite you made flying up above and thinks for a moment an angel is there bringing back love. If I must die, let it bring hope. Let it be a tear. 
Um, so I'm going to read maybe just a couple of poems from my first poetry collection. Unfortunately, I say this again and again. Many of the poems that I wrote over the past few years, I thought that would, you know, that that's the end of them. I just put them there. Nothing is going to happen again. But unfortunately, many of the poems keep keep happening again and again. I'm going to read this uh, very special poem that I wrote about a family of uh, the uh, Panani family in North Gaza who were killed in an airstrike in, 20, in May 2021. Um, and, I, and very sadly that so many, so many other whole families have been wiped out, including my cousin's family, Tahrir Abu Toha, who was killed with her husband and their five children. So I wrote that this poem, Shrapnel Looking for Laughter. The house has been bombed, everyone dead. The kids, the parents, the, the toys, the actors on TV, characters in novels, personas in poetry collections, the I, the he, and the she, no pronouns left, not even for kids when they learn parts of speech next year. Shrapnel flies in the dark, looks for the family's peals of laughter, hiding behind piles of disfigured walls and bleeding picture frames. The radio no longer speaks. Its batteries have burned, the antenna is broken. Even the broadcaster felt the pain when the radio was hit. Even we, hearing the bomb as it fell, threw ourselves to the ground, each of us counting the others around them. We were safe but our hearts still ache. And just after the May 2021 attacks, none of us were safe. I mean, we, I said we were safe, but our hearts still ache. Unfortunately, I was about, our house in Beit Lahia, North Gaza was bombed in, in October 2023. Fortunately, uh, we were lucky because no one in my family, not my parents, not my siblings and their children, there were about 25 people in that house, more than half of them, were children. So luckily we were not in the house when it was born. And talking about our home, I'm going to read the second poem in the poetry collection, uh, which is called What is Home? Which was, I think, translated into maybe 30 languages when I was kidnapped uh, back in November. What is home? It is the shade of trees on my way to school before they were uprooted. It is my grandparents' black and white wedding photo before the walls crumbled. It is my uncle's prayer rug where dozens of ants slipped on wintry nights before it was looted and put in a museum. It is the oven my mother used to bake bread and roast chicken before a bomb reduced our house to ashes. It is the cafe where I watched football matches and played. My child stops me. Can a four letter word hold all of these? So I wrote that poem and our house was not uh, reduced to ashes by a bomb, but two years after the book came out, it was bombed and unfortunately nothing is left except for the concrete and some books. Um, now I'm going to read some poems that I posted during the, the, current, the ongoing genocide, uh, some of which are, are, are going to be part of the forthcoming collection. I have the, the galleys here. So the book is uh, going to be published uh, officially in three months. So I'm going to read just a few poems that I wrote during uh, this uh, ongoing genocide. Well, actually, before I read uh, the poem that I wrote during this genocide, I'm going to read a poem called What a Gazan Should Do During an Israeli Airstrike. So that was a set of instructions for parents, for, you know, for family members about what to do when there is an Israeli airstrike. But again, unfortunately, this poem does not apply, apply to the current circumstances because you can't do any of these. What a Gazan should do during an Israeli airstrike. Turn off the lights in every room. Sit in the inner hallway of the house, away from the windows. Stay away from the stove. Stop thinking about making black tea. Have a bottle of water nearby, big enough to cool down children's fear. Get a child's kindergarten backpack and stuff tiny toys and whatever amount of money there is. And the ID cards and photos of late grandparents, aunts or uncles, and the grandparents wedding invitation that's been kept for a long time. And if you are a farmer, 
you should put some strawberry seeds in one pocket and some soil from the balcony flower pot in the other and hold on tight to whatever number there was on the cake from the last birthday. So some poems that I wrote during the genocide, watching things around me, uh, even after I left Gaza in December, I still uh, remain in touch with my family. I hear stories from my friends. I, I watch videos through some local channels. It's very heartbreaking. So this, this poem is called Right or Left. Under the rubble, her body has remained for days and days. When the war ends, we try to remove the rubble, stone after stone. We only find one small bone from her body. It's a bone from her arm. Right or left, it does not matter, as long as we cannot find the henna from the neighbor's wedding on her skin, or the ink from a school pen on a little index finger. The moon. And I wrote this poem after watching, after, after seeing two photos, one of a father and his daughter who were trying to run away from bombing, but they were killed in an airstrike and she, the father and the, the daughter were wearing their backpacks. And the other photo is of, was of um, a young man who was, who had some, after he was killed in an airstrike, he had some cats on his body trying to eat from his body because bodies in Gaza have been left for months sometimes because no ambulances, no, no firefighters could approach the area because the Israeli soldiers would open fire at them. So this poem is called The Moon. She's lying on the asphalt. Her small belly, her chest, her forehead, her hands, her cold feet bare in the night. A hungry cat paces. Shrapnel rings as it hits neighboring houses of ready bomb. The hungry cat sees the girl, her wounds still warm, hungrier. The girl's father lies next to her on his back. The backpack he wears still has the girl's favorite candy and a small toy. The girl was waiting till they arrived to eat her lily pop. The cat gets closer to try the flesh. A bum pounds the street. No flesh, no girl, no father, no cat. Nobody is hungry. The moon overhead. Is not the moon. This poem is called For a Moment, and I wrote it after I watched uh, a young man carrying the the uh, the dead body of a young of a girl who was killed in a, uh, again in a, in, a, in an airstrike. So I was wondering why was he running with the body when we when he knew that she was she was killed. I mean, what what, what was the point in him? running while she was dead. So I wrote that this poem for a moment. Her small body rides in my arms as I run to the hospital. There is no electricity and the inner hallways are a forest lined with cots. The girl I carry is dead, I know that. The pressure of the explosion tore apart her, her thin veins. I know she is dead, but everyone who sees us runs after us. You are alive for a moment when living people run after you. Mm, okay. Next poem is No Art, and it's written after Elizabeth Bishop's uh, The Art of Losing Isn't Hard to Master. So this poem is called No Art. Yeah. So her poem was One Art. This poem is No Art. The art, of the art of losing isn't hard to master, Elizabeth Bishop. You know everything will come to an end. The sugar, the tea, the dried sage, the water. Just go to the market and restock. Even your shadow will abandon you when there is no light. So just keep things that require only you. The book of poems that, that only you can decipher. The blank map of a country whose cities and villages only you can recognize. I have personally lost three friends. So this poem was written 
uh, two years ago. So in this point, <laughs> if I was to write this poem today, it would be more and more. I've personally lost the three friends to war, a city to darkness and a language to fear. That this is not easy to survive, but survival proved necessary to master. But of all things, losing the only photo of my grandfather under the rubble of our, my house was a real disaster. My dreams as a child. I still have dreams about a room filled with toys. My mother always promised if we could have, if we were rich. I still have dreams about seeing the refugee camp from a window on a plane. I still have dreams about seeing the animals I learned about in third grade, elephant, giraffe, kangaroo, and wolf. I still have dreams about running for miles and miles with no border blocking my feet, with no unexploded bombs scaring me off. I still have dreams about my favorite team playing soccer on the beach to come, my, uh, me waiting for the ball to come my way and run away with it. I dream still about my grandfather, how much I want to pick oranges with him in Yaffa. But, Yaf, but my grandfather died. Yaffa is occupied and oranges no longer grow in his weeping grove. Uh, okay, this one last poem, Younger Than War. Tanks roll through dust, through eggplant fields, beds unmade, lightning in the sky. My brother jumps to the window to watch warplanes, clouds of smoke after airstrikes, warplanes, Eagles searching for a branch on which to perch. No need for the radio, we are the news. Ants' ears hurt with each bullet fired from wrathful machine guns. Soldiers advance with e sorry, soldiers advance, burn books, some smoke rolled sheets of yesterday's newspaper, just like they did when they were kids. Our kids hide in the basement, backs against concrete pillars. Heads between knees, parents silent, humid down there, and the heat of burning buns adds to the slow death of survival. In September 2000, I bought bread for dinner. I saw a helicopter fire a rocket into a tower, concrete and glass filled from high, loaves of stale bread. At the time, I was seven, days younger than war, a few years older than the bombs. Shukran. Thank Shukran. Thank you so much, Mossad. Yes, thank you so much. Um, listening to all your words and all the stories and all the images, I feel my heart splitting and I'm also grateful for the ability, the courage, the, the strength to turn horror into beauty, into something that we can witness. I think often that my um, work as an artist is to transform destructive energy into creation and uh, that that's part of that's part of the transformation that is needed to achieve liberation, yeah? So with that reflection, I'd just like to open it up to all of the poets to share reflections on each other's work or anything that is rising in you um, now after hearing each other and sharing with each other in this way. So here. I'm humbled as fuck to be here. I feel very humble. That's, I can't believe that they've turned our poets into forensic analysts and they've killed our journalists. And, and I'm looking at Naomi's face and this, I just feel humility and I ask for bravery 
وبالعربي بدي اقول لنا انا فلسطيني انه قاعد يتفرج علينا احنا بنكون غرب لبعض كثير بنكون غرب لبعض بس لسه واحد بنضلنا واحد ما اسي يو سون حبيبي طب I can't wait. So I, I just want to say something. Sorry, Naomi. I, I, no, no, that's it. Just, I mean, I'm just amazed, and, and this should amaze everyone, that we as Palestinians, in the first place, we are all human beings. We are poets. We are <laughs> artists. But I mean, our ability to write and to, to share this pain as if everyone, I mean, I am the only one maybe here who, <laughs> who came out of Gaza during this genocide. But the way everyone expressed their feelings and their compassion and you know their pain feels like every one of us was was there in Gaza. So I mean, our ability to cross the border to just you know remove the distances between this continent and 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 Palestine where Gaza is, this ability just show us how how human this war can make us. And I'm still amazed why other people who are adding more fuel to this genocide, why do why, why they don't feel this? I mean, as if, I don't know, they are, <laughs> I'm, I don't want to say this because we know this, as if they, they are not, they, they just turn, they just turn their TVs off after October 7th, and they have never watched anything before October 7th. So I feel like they only... The only thing that happened to these people was opening their TVs uh, for about three or four hours in the morning of October 7. That was the only the only time they ever turned on their TVs. And then they turned it off as if they took the photos and videos and they uh, they plastered them on their bathroom walls, on their kitchen walls, on the, in the street. They kept seeing what happened on October 7th for a few hours. And they've never paid any any respect to the people who have been suffering before October 7th and after October 7th. Mosab and all of you, I think that's why your poems are so instructive because they give a context for history and yes. people who haven't been paying attention, if they read your poems and say, wait, this happened in 2019 or 2020, they, oh wait, this has been going on. This is a cycle. One thing I want to thank you all for is the tremendous humanity I felt in every single piece that was read. And that's something that I think we've all felt so uh, lonely for in the news and the way this is portrayed. Where is humanity? People proclaiming all these different religions. Where's religion? Uh, what's happening? How can this just continue in the cycle with, with such ceaseless vengeance. And uh, thank you all for your passionate work and, and for opening a window to your readers, your listeners, neighbors. Thank you. Sab, I was very struck by your, you know, the poems, they encapsulate such a moment in time and you freeze that moment and there's a surrealism in the image, like the moon, the, the moon that was no longer the moon. And also I was, you know, really, really beautiful work. Thank you so much. And then I just wanted to ask you, a journalist from Gaza said he lost a sense of his self, himself, a sense of self, he said. And it struck me, it resonated with a line from one of your poems about losing, not finding the shadow because the light was gone. And I wanted to ask you, can you talk about that? Can you talk about how does one remore find themselves again? Yeah, I can try to understand what he meant. Um, and I can I can tell you from, from my own experience. My wife lost her uncle who was killed by a sniper. He was born deaf and he had uh, two children. My wife lost her uncle. She then, she then lost her, her, her grandfather um, for, for illness. I also lost my grandfather for illness. There was no treatment. What strikes us, what shocks us is that we only grieved for an hour or two. Our house was bombed and we just cried for a few minutes and that's it. 
we lost a, a many, many friends. We cried for a few minutes. Sometimes you will be shocked to see that someone did not cry over his killed brother. I mean, as if we, I don't know. I mean, we lost we lost the, the meaning of being a human being. You know, even animals would, you know, would shout, would scream in the wilderness when, 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 when it's when their babies or their house, their their, their uh, abode are are are, ra or are raised by human beings. I mean, animals have feelings. We have feelings, but I mean, we feel like we are not reacting properly. This war did not only take our houses, houses and friends and families and, you know, our education from us, but it also has taken away from us our, our proper emotional reactions. Why I have maybe an explanation for this, it's because this still go, is going on and we are just delaying this. I don't want to cry now. I don't, maybe to, yeah, the next day I would be killed or I would lose another parent or... I don't know. So they are delaying. They are just pushing this, this emotional reaction farther and farther until this it comes to an end. I can tell you the story of, I mean, this is heartbreaking for me just to remember. Uh, I think in March, I think I posted about this a few when, when it happened. A few months ago, I think it was February or March, um, there was the news about that uh, the killing of a whole family, Hamdona family in North Gaza. And I recognize the name of the father, Mish'al Hamdona. Oh, that's my, my, my friend's father, a schoolmate. That's my friend's father. And then I saw the name of the wife also being killed and the children and the grandchildren. I didn't see my friend's name, Nasim. I didn't see his name. Oh, I, I, I mean, I felt, I felt relieved. I said, oh, maybe he's in Belgium. Maybe he's in Germany. He, he, he immigrated, immigrated just like other friends did. I went to the page of the friend who posted about this. I scrolled down and I saw that my friend Nassim was murdered two days before that. He was killed in the uh, wheat flour massacre on Ar Rashid Street in Gaza City. So I, I then scrolled down and I saw that the mother who was killed two days after Nassim was killed was kissing him goodbye. I mean, just imagine this happening to everyone. Uh, I mean, as if, I mean, I feel like we are being turned into chickens in a cage and everyone is waiting for his turn. So when a chicken is taken, you don't have, I mean, any power to stop, you know, the slaughterer from taking the, the chicken that's next to you. Okay. So I don't, I, you, you, you don't, you don't see, you know, other chickens reacting or maybe making any sound, you know, hey, where are you taking this chicken? Okay. I think, I think this, this, this world, not, uh, not only Israel, but this world, has has made us has turned us into i mean i don't know what what, what the word would be but i mean I, we don't we 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 stopped being able to react as properly uh, as properly as we should be doing so they have they have abducted our lives our physical lives our homes our our universities our mosques our churches our streets you know, our childhood, I mean, now my child is two, four years old. He just witnessed his father being taken away from him when I was kidnapped. I mean, you know, when I was stopped at one airport, I was again taken for questioning by the TSA. I mean, that same experience reminded me and they also reminded my children of the Israeli soldiers taking me away from my from my from my family. Because I just imagine our childhood being abducted, our lives our children, our siblings are being abducted from us, and also our emotionality being abducted from us. We are not even, we do not even have the, the capacity to show our emotions, even in front of each other. So maybe that's, you know, uh, but I think poetry for me, uh, and as it does to every, for everyone, it, it helps us uh, to show this emotion uh, in the form of arts. Uh, so this is why I value every one of you, because you are documenting, because you are doing the work of journalists who are not allowed to go to Gaza. Uh, we in Gaza have been doing our best to reflect and to document the massacres and the suffering that every one of us has been going on for at least not 10 months. And you in the outside world who haven't been to Gaza have been, have you, have been doing your job uh, by documenting not only what you saw, but also how you felt about it. That's why writing and 
and writing whether it's a poem or or a, an essay is very important. It's your role. It's your it's your part uh, of witnessing. Most of what you're saying is, you know, that what I get, what I understand in what you're saying is that the magnitude of what is happening, the the magnitude of this genocide and this brutality is beyond what any human organism can contain. And it and it um, its intention is to numb, right? Its intention is to dehumanize. And I think what's so important in what everyone here is doing as artists, as poets, is uh, to create places where we can feel again, where we can mourn, where we can express. And even sometimes when we ourselves are battling the numbness to feel it, we can describe and paint with our words so that uh, we hope the people listening, the people reading can can feel, can understand. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to add that it's it's not only about uh, our feelings being numbed by what's going on, but it's our fear. We don't. I mean, we are afraid even to show our sadness or, or our, you know, our our emotional devastation. I mean, we are scared. We are. We just don't want to do anything that would even add more fear to ourselves because we know we could be the next victim. So I mean, you know, I mean, when you are imprisoned, okay. And you are given you are given food sometimes, and you know that the next day they are going to execute you. I mean, would you be eating? Even if you are hungry, you are not going to eat because you know. I mean, what what purpose would be if I eat you know a lot of food or if I eat a fresh vegetable or or fruit? And this is what's happening in Gaza. People know that even if they lost a father or a mother or a sibling or you know or a, a whole family, just like I did. Uh, I, I lost about 30 members of my extended family. Even, even if you lost a friend or a father, you know that the next day you could be the one who would be mourned. So there, there is no point in mourning at all. So I think that, that's how I understand it. I felt it, you know, in some way. And also, um, also Musab, I, I, I found myself wondering at the word lucky when you said, oh, we were lucky. We weren't in the house. We were lucky. And it's, do you know, like it's when there's so much loss and you use the word lucky, it's just, it it strikes me in a way like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if I'm making yeah. sense here, but. Yeah, yeah. What does it mean to be lucky? Yeah. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think uh, lucky is, is, uh, is, is the right word because. Many people have been lucky to survive death. I survived death when our house was bombed. You know, four hours after we left our house in Bethlehem, and to, to, when we after we four hours after we moved to stay with my grandparents' family in Jabalia camp, four hours after that, a house seventy meters away from us was bombed, and thirty people were killed. So, uh, you could be lucky and unlucky. Why? Because. You could survive nine months or eight months and be killed tomorrow. So what's the point of surviving eight months? So people have been running and, you know, like just like uh, Muhammad Bahar, you know, the, the you know, the, the innocent boy with, with Down syndrome who was who was killed by a dog and, and who was left to bleed by the Israeli soldier. I mean, for Muhammad, his wife mentioned that they had to, to, to move 15 times. I mean, after after Muhammad was killed, and, uh, you know, by the soldier. What point, I mean, did it matter that he moved, he had to move 15 times or 50 times even? I mean, it's heartbreaking that you have to survive in order to be killed the next day. This is why I think that people in Gaza are unable to, you know, process what they are feeling and or even to show it. Yeah. We have about um, five minutes of our time together before we have to welcome the next session. I wonder if uh, Suhair, Naomi, Dima, or Zena, you want to um, respond or reflect more for a moment? I just want to, I want to thank you. Um, I want to say, 
Puerto Rico, Mexico, Brooklyn, all over the world. I have seen, as you have seen Habibi through the screen, people learning about Palestine and this luck that we have, that we pay for with our blood, generation after generation. And at the same time, the utter horror and the beyond the capability, except Habibti, we are absorbing it. Everyone mm -hmm. says we it's impossible, but it's happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I just want to thank you. And Baba says we will win. Baba says we will win. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when um, I was moved by this, uh, this the, t the title of this session, The Moon Will Rise from Darkness uh, by Darwish, that quote, um, I just have to keep reminding myself that this is truly the first time that I have seen globally people around the world coming out for Palestine in in the in the hundreds and thousands and millions and it makes me think that uh i that i agree with your baba <laughs> that i agree that 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 liberation there comes a point when liberation is inevitable and it's a long hard road to get there but it is inevitable and we i feel like we're at that point and palestinian liberation is coming Palestine will be free. Um, I think on that note, I'm going to thank all of you beautiful, beautiful souls, beautiful artists, beautiful people, um, and start to welcome our next session. Thank you so much. Love, Love to all of you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. You should Love be proud. This, this will be remembered, inshallah, and the young generation, when they grow up, they are coming, they are going to search for what everyone did, what every poet wrote, what every ad, you know, did, yes. ad, what everyone, you know, said about this, you know, from day one to day 10, 10 100 to the, you know, so we should, we should keep doing this because it will count one day, if not for us, but for the next generation. Inshallah. Okay, much love to everyone. Thank you, Naomi, <laughs> Suhair, <laughs> Zena, and Dima, and Andrea, and the team. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> God be with you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Um, and now it is time for me to welcome our next uh, moderator and our next session. Um, the next piece will be um, a, reading, a play reading and conversation um, as we near the end. Uh, or What Adorno Said by Yusuf El Gendi. And um, we have back our wonderful moderator and fearless leader of um, Mina Theater in the United States, <laughs> uh, Taranj Yagazarian. Taranj, it's so great to see you. Um, thank you so thank much. Thank you, Andrea, for that beautiful session. <laughs>